Hello and welcome to Hospitality Hot Dish Fresh from the Oven. I am Kate Conroy, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships here at Hospitality Minnesota, which is a member-driven organization dedicated to educating, supporting, and advocating for Minnesota's hospitality industry. What you can expect from the Hot Dish are conversations with restaurants, hotels, resorts, campgrounds, and the allied members who support those businesses in the state of Minnesota. We release a new episode every other Thursday, so be on the lookout for those. Speaking of which, you can find The Hot Dish just about anywhere you can download a podcast. We even put them up on YouTube. So check us out and don't forget to leave a five-star review so that the algorithm gets us in front of other awesome people just like you. Special shout out to today's sponsor, D'Amico Catering. Over the past 25 years, D'Amico Catering has earned and maintained a reputation as the region's premier caterer. They've orchestrated more than 70,000 events and year after year, they have been caterer of choice for the most significant cultural, corporate, and philanthropic events in Minneapolis and St. Paul. With me today is Mike Newland of TJ Hooligans in Prior Lake, Minnesota. Mike, say hi and let the audience hear your voice. Hi, how are, how are you? Very good. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to jump right in, Mike. Uh, real hardball question right off the bat. What is your favorite hot dish? <laughs> Well, I'm not originally from Minnesota, so I don't eat a lot of hot dish. I'm from Nebraska. Um, I don't know. Whatever my mother-in-law cooks, I guess. <laughs> that's a really good answer. Staying uh, on the side a, of uh, that's a safe, all things that's right. That's a safe answer. Yeah. That's a really safe answer. Uh, just wanted to to shout out um, Mike's food at TJ Hooligans. I keep wanting to say Hooligans. I don't know why. Hooligans. TJ Hooligans. It is the best cream of uh, wild rice soup I have ever had hands down in my life and i wanted to just uh shout that out real fast yeah that's that's one of our specialties here i mean we make everything from scratch and and that's you know that's a soup that we have on every day because it's it's the most requested one so i'll pass that on to books that you enjoyed it thank you uh next question mike in terms of hospitality what is your why why well i've been in the hospitality industry pretty much all my life. I mean, uh, before owning this uh, restaurant, I was in the horse racing industry, uh, managing racetracks all over the country from being part of Canterbury Park to uh, the Meadowlands out in New Jersey to running tracks in Florida and Nebraska. So I've always always had kind of a, a fondness for, you know, entertaining guests and, and the hospitality industry in general. I, I know when I go out as a customer, I want to feel like uh, you know, wherever I go, the place uh, is welcoming me and, and accommodating me and the food's good and the service is great. It's a really good answer to what's your why. I like that. I like that. And, and, I, and I got sick of corporate America and, and moving around <laughs> the country, so I decided to buy a restaurant. You really have lived all over the place. You're originally from Nebraska and you've, you've worked as far away as New Jersey and now you're in Minnesota. You're all over. Yeah, I spent uh, I spent about 11 years in Florida. So if uh, you ask me oh. where, where I'd rather be, it, it'd probably be Florida, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've had, uh, quite a, uh, career in, in the racing industry and, uh, you know, it's, it's a business that is very much like the restaurant business. I mean, our, our goal in the racing industry is not only to get you to wager on horse racing or whatever the case may be, but, uh, the number two source of revenue at a racetrack is food and beverage. So I've always been very involved in food and beverage, and I, you know, it, it was a good tie-in for me to buy the restaurant because of my experience with the, the racetrack. Nice, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, but New Jersey has a huge horse presence. Like um, outside of, I don't know, Kentucky, I guess is where like horses are are bred. But the Meadowlands is um, a huge business, but also in New Jersey, there are tons of horse farms, right? So yeah, more intuitive. I- yeah, New Jersey and upstate New York. Uh, I, uh, other than other than Kentucky and maybe Florida, uh, I would say New Jersey and New York probably are, are the California a little bit, but not not as heavily as Jersey and New York. And how did you uh, settle on Prior Lake when you were uh, coming back to Minnesota? Or coming to well, my wife my wife's family is originally from St. Paul, so when we moved to Florida for one of my my first jobs uh, abroad, uh, we moved down to Florida and. Um, lived in Jupiter, Florida, which is just outside of Palm Beach. And while I loved it there, she was too far away from her family and, and always kind of wanted to be back in the Midwest. And, and then that's when I got the uh, position at Canterbury Park 
uh, on, a, on a director level at Canterbury Park. We moved back up here and I had a house here and my kids uh, went to school in Prior Lake and they all stayed while I've been traveling over the past 13 years. So um, I would come home and visit every couple of weeks and get back on the road and, and do the uh, do the corporate world and just got mm-hmm. exhausting and, and not being able to see my kids on a regular basis. You know, now my kids are got two of them in college and they work here during breaks and they work here in the summer. So I get to spend a lot of time with them. Nice. That's a, that's a great answer being uh, close to family and prior Lake is such a nice community. It is. It's a, it's a really nice community. I mean, uh, per capita it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a fairly wealthy community, especially if you can afford to live on the lake. But, uh, so mm-hmm. that, you know, when I was looking at uh, a restaurant to buy, I wanted to make sure it was in a, a part of the suburbs that was economically strong and, and growing and not oversaturated with restaurants to begin with. So Prairie Lake's been a great location for us. I literally live four minutes from here. So it works oh out. Oh my gosh. Well. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get deeper. And we're back. Mike, I have another hard hitting question for you. What is your favorite Minnesota escape? You know, for years, uh, my my family we would always go up to Grandview Lodge, and uh, <laughs> I, I really like it up there. It's a great escape. Um, you know, it's it's grown over the years, but I think that you know, going to some of those resorts up in another Minnesota are special times. I mean, we we've been doing it since our kids were small, and you know, it's it's just a nice getaway and. It, that's a very nice property. We haven't checked out too many of the other places. I've been to Breezy Point and some of the other, but we really have a fondness for Grandview Lodge. That's awesome. I'm so uh, I'm so glad to hear it. They're a member and they're wonderful. They're great to work with. They're great people. But all right, last question, um, Mike. What keeps you up at night? Owning a restaurant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. It's. Uh, yeah, I mean, coming from the corporate world where, yeah, I was always on call, it's a, it's a different level when you own a restaurant, right? It's, uh, water pipe broke at 3 a.m. Uh, Jim's not coming into work and he just called in 15 minutes ago. Um, you know, a lot of things keep you up at night. I think, you know, making ends meet in this business is extremely difficult. Uh, you know, I've talked about it before, but, you know, in other states that I've worked in, um, you know, the, the other states, uh, my payroll will be 40 to 50% less than it is here because of the tip credit. You know, Minnesota is one of only seven states that doesn't allow for tip credit. Um, and while I love seeing people, you know, make money and, and, uh, you know, I want to make sure all my employees are living well. Um, you know, most of the time our employees are averaging over 40, $50 an hour and going home with more money I make (laughs) than I make in the week. Um, so I think tip credit issue to me, there has to be some rationale and and some sort of tip credit, you know, the minimum wage goes up every year, uh, you know, and if the average employee is making 18 to 20%, on tips, uh, you know, they're doing, they're doing very well for a part-time job. Uh, can so you the, explain, I'm sorry, can you explain what tip credit is for people who might not know? Yeah. Like for example, in, in Nebraska or Wisconsin, yeah, the minimum wage in a tipped position, uh, might be $3 and 50 cents, um, for a tipped position, but the actual minimum wage in the state may be $10. Okay. So you've got, you know, you've got that that separation there, uh, where if an employee makes enough in tips that gets them from that $3, uh, up to $10 an hour, uh, if they make enough in tips, it's called tip credit. So you don't have to pay $10 per hour. You pay $3 per hour because they made the rest. Oh, in I got you. Okay. Minnesota is one of only seven States, uh, where, you know, my employee can make, and I've had it happen on a, on a regular basis, three or $400 in a four hour shift. And I still have to pay wow. the full minimum wage, um, right. which, you, you know, it's very difficult then it, and it's, it gets passed on to the consumer eventually, you know, with 
with some of the things that are going on in the state of Minnesota, you know, small independent restaurants and restaurants in general, hospitality industry in general, it's tough to make a go of it because your your expenses are are nearly double what it would be if I moved to Wisconsin or if I moved to Nebraska with my family. Right. Um, you know, there has to be some sort of logic to it, and and it doesn't really make sense that uh, an employee can make four to you know three or four hundred dollars in a four hour shift, but I still have to pay. We still have to pay the full minimum wage. Um, to that that employee uh, on a part time you know you know part time job, um, so that you know that's one thing that I think really Minnesota has to take a hard look at. Uh, the other thing you know is some of these new laws that are coming out that you, one that we talked about previously, uh, the earn sick and safe time. Um, yeah. And again, while I'd like to see my employees and I offer my employees benefits, you know benefits uh, health dental. Uh, life, uh, short-term disability. Um, you know, we have uh, bonus programs and things like that. I mean, while I like to see everyone, uh, you know, get what they that they deserve, the the fact that there's no exemptions in this, no exemptions for number of employees, no exemptions for age. I mean, when I have a host, you know, a lot of my probably 60, 70 percent of my staff is high school students college students. Right. So to say that I'm going to have to pay a host, a 15 year old <laughs> sick time, right. um, it just it, it kind of blows my mind and it, it doesn't make logical sense. Uh, you know, I, I would be okay with, all right, anybody that's classified as, as full time, which, you know, full time is the 30 hours or 32 hours a week in most states. If they're classified as full time, yes, then they should probably earn earn sick time. That's fine with me. But when you have a, a employee that works, you know, two, maybe three times a week, four hour shift, that's 15, 16 years old, it's going to get abused. And it's, a, and it's an additional expense that not only are you paying that employee to stay home sick, but now you're going to have to pay another employee to come in and take their spot. Right. Yep. So you're double, you're doubling your expense. Um, you know, so I we're gonna have to see how this plays out. I think you know, like we talked about a few weeks ago, I think what's gonna happen is I have to reduce my roster. Right, the only way that I can afford to to pay the the sick time is to reduce the number of people that that I'm employing. Um, right now, I employ about 44 people on a year round basis. You know, if I have to pay 48 hours of of sick time to each employee as they accrue those hours. That's a big chunk of money that I don't have, and that most independently owned restaurants do not have. Um, so I think that the you know the the one the the big net just everybody's doing the same thing does not work, and uh, we know what's going to happen. They're going to bank those hours. Yeah, we're in the yeah. hospital industry. We know what's going to happen. They're going to bank right. those hours until December when they want to take time off for Christmas or New Year's Eve or whatever the case may be. They're going to bank those hours and store them up. And now, you know, they can just call and say, hey, I'm sick. I'm not coming in. I can't ask them for a doctor's note unless they miss more than three days. I can't ask them why. I can't ask them, you know, it could be their brother's, their niece that's sick. And by this law, they could take off. They can designate anyone they want on a yearly basis to say, well, if that person gets sick, I'm taking off and we can't ask them. We can't, you know, there can be no, you know, form of, uh, you know, reducing their hours because they're calling in sick. It's just, it's putting an ownership, it's putting ownership in a very difficult spot uh, and, and adding to the expense of owning a, a business like this that, that we don't have, you know, we, we barely break even right now. And to add what could be another 25 to $30,000 expense without, passing that on to the customer, I don't know how anybody's going to do it. I mean, the we have to raise our prices to pay for this. This is it. Right. When Minnesota passes these laws, they think that they're protecting the employee. Well, they may not be protecting the employee when there's going to be less jobs because of it. And yeah. more, the, the consumer is paying more for a hamburger because I have to account for this twenty or $30,000 to pay for earn sick and safe time. So 
it's going to have a chain reaction. Uh, you, you know as well as I do that restaurants are closing on a regular basis in Minnesota. And I think that some of these new laws may be the thing that breaks the camel's back and, and pushes a lot of a lot of mom and pop shops out of business. So I was just thinking, you know, we talk about age discrimination at the top level, um, but a, a law like this might encourage owners like you, owners and operators, to not necessarily hire the 15, 16, 17 year old because they are the ones who are most likely to call out in a moment's notice because they've got friends, you know, it's Christmas time, it's Thanksgiving, they're, they they have a social life. Um, but jobs like those, jobs like yours, is where workforce development happens. It's where they learn the hard skills and the soft skills that are going to be necessary for life. Um, and so it's sort of this weird unintended consequence that could very well impact owners and operators 15 10, maybe even five years on the line. Yeah, I mean, we we have a good system here, and I think I, you know, I, I've said it before, and we're kind of proud of it. I've only hired one person off the street in the past year. So we have wow. a system here where, you know, when when we have a host now, I had nine, I had nine kids graduate high school last year and go on to college. We replaced them immediately in host and expo positions. Usually under 18, I only let them work as a host, a dishwasher or an expo. So I had nine kids graduate last year and we replaced them with their younger siblings. And, I and, love and that. you know, friends of my family, their kids are in high school that have two more years. So we, we start the 15, 16 year old as a host, teach them how to expo, teach them how to be a runner. And then when they hit 18, then they can start becoming a server. Um, you know, so we, and from a server, you start training to be a bartender and then the, the you know, so we have a good system of, of growth and development, but, you know, it, it's it's tough to get the, the high school kids because they have so many other activities going on, even though we pretty much abide by their, their wishes on their schedules. It's tough to, to now have this new law where I just had a kid call on this afternoon. He was supposed to expo tonight and just called this afternoon and said, I'm not feeling good. I'm not coming in. Well, I can't ask him. Have you checked with anybody else to see if they can take your ship? With this new law, I cannot ask him to find a replacement. I have to find a replacement. So, you know, is he sick? Maybe, yeah, he could be. But, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. And it's my yeah. burden now to find somebody to work for him and pay that person who may not be as capable as he was to do the expo. Um, so it's just, it's going to be a chain reaction. And I, I think in the end... Uh, you know, the state of Minnesota is going to find out that you, you can't throw a blanket over one thing and, and, and treat it as a whole, you know? Yeah. The one size fits all approach is just never a good idea. Well, in 2026, aren't we going to be dealing with the, uh, family medical leave act, paid family medical leave. Right. Um, and again, I, again, you were it. This position, this this industry, we deal with mostly people that are using this as a part time job. This is not right. their full time income. Um, so, you know, again, you want to you want to treat your employees well. You want to make sure your employees are safe. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're providing the best work environment for them. And obviously, if I have only hired one person in a year. Uh, this is a good place to work, and and some of the things we do here uh, help retain employees. Um, but the, the expenses of of these new laws are literally going to put people out of business, and it's going to be the opposite effect. Instead of paying somebody to sit home now, you're paying them unemployment because your business just closed. Yeah, it's and a really what effect, what effect is that going to have on the state of Minnesota? It's a really sobering thought for sure. Oh, before we get too dark, uh, is there anything coming up that you'd like to promote? Yeah, we do a thing called Music Bingo here. Uh, I, I may have told you about it, but we do yeah. a thing called Music Bingo. And it's a it's a game I picked up when I was living in Omaha, managing track down there. I, I stopped at this uh, bar and grill one night on a Thursday and, and walked in and every table was marked reserved. And I said, well, what's going on? Why can't I... Why can't I have a table? Just sit here and 
have a drink and something to eat. And they said, well, tonight's music bingo. Every table's reserved every Thursday. You have to book in about a week in advance to get in. And so the following week, I said, well, I got to check out what this is. So the following week, I made a reservation. I went to this place and, and they have this game called music bingo. And they give you a card and each person's got a different card. And in the in the boxes, instead of letters and numbers, uh, there's names of songs. And the DJ plays 20 or 30 seconds of a song. You have to recognize what that song is. See if it's on your card. When you get a bingo, you take it up and they verify. Uh, and then you win a free drink or, uh, you know, buy a dollar off. Uh, us, we give away a lot of big stuff. But um, and it was just fun. You know, I, you, I'm i not the type of person that would ever sit through a bingo game. <laughs> I could love this because it was music and I love music and I yeah. love all the Andres and it was just, you know, people singing along, a couple of gals got up and started dancing. It was just a lot of fun. So when I bought this place, I reached out to the owner of, it's called the Music Bingo Company. I, I reached out to him and I said, hey, Elliot, I bought this restaurant and I, I think Music Bingo would be a big hit here. How can we do this? And he said, well, yeah, I can get you set up and get you, you know, send you the file to print your bingo card. You can find a local printer to print them. You know, I send you the playlist. I've got, you know, a bunch of different playlists and genres to choose from. Um, and we could do it all, you know, via Google Drive. And then I'll just bill you a monthly a monthly fee to do it, you know, a royalty. And so we started doing it up here about a year and a half ago. And we do it on Thursday nights, every Thursday at 730. And our business has gone up 75 to 85 percent. Uh, we sell out every Thursday night. Our dining room holds about 80 people. We sell out every Thursday notoriously. Um, so we've started adding a few here and there. Uh, you know, tomorrow night we're going to do our first college edition music Ooh. bingo, which is already sold out, which is 21 and over. And we play younger uh, genre of music, but we do a baby boomer edition once a month on a Sunday afternoon. We do a disco Fun. country version. So it's it's really taken off. Uh, we're even doing some private parties uh, at different locales. Uh, so it's really taken off and, and, you know, if you look at our Facebook page, you see some of the videos and some of the stuff that we post from there. But, uh, you know, we're, we're at the point where, uh, the deal I made with the guy that owns the company is if anybody wants to do it in Minnesota, I could get them started and get them set up. And so we're in the process of kind of spreading our wings a little bit, making sure that anybody that's wants to do it isn't too close to our, our territory, but. It's it's really a fun game and and it's is dra drastically increased our business. That is fantastic! What a cool idea! Yeah, I remember you telling me about that, and I was like, oh, I have to get there one night for it. It's so cool sounding. It is. It is. Check out our Facebook page. Look at some of our videos and stuff. It gets uh, you know, especially when we do a later night one, like a Saturday night. We do a Saturday night once or twice a month, uh, which doesn't start till nine p.m. and that's more of an adult adult specific crowd and you know we'll give away anything from a, a bottle of fireball to a $25 gift card or whatever but uh yeah it's it's a lot of fun and and we hope to start moving that uh we added a bar down in Mankato called Rounders uh that has been doing it for about a year and they're doing very well with it um so we're we're starting to spread it out a little bit and have some other places pick it up fantastic how can people get in touch if they uh want to make a reservation or Say hello. Always, yeah, always through Facebook. Our Facebook page, DJ Hooligans Pub and Grub, uh, Prior Lake, Minnesota. So if anybody wants to make a reservation, we always encourage them to do so at least a week in advance because it does sell out. So you just like our Facebook page and DM us, send us a direct message on Facebook, and that's how we do all of our reservations. Fantastic. Okay, that is the show. One last shout out to our sponsor, D'Amico Catering. Over the past 25 years, D'Amico Catering has earned and maintained a reputation as the region's premier caterer. They've orchestrated more than 70,000 events, and year after year, they have been caterer of choice for the most significant cultural, corporate, and philanthropic events in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Mike Newland with TJ Hooligans in Prior Lake, Minnesota. Thank you so much for joining me today. And to all of you out there listening, we will see you next time.